It is such a good thing to be able to sing together and lift our voices and to hear you singing. And it's just a delight and a joy and really a gift from God that we're able to do that. So thankful that we can do that today. And it's good to look out and see each of you here. And it's been good to see our crowds uh, grow in number as we've kind of come back from uh, whatever you would call what we've been through over the last uh, majority of a year. And so it's a delight to see you here this morning. And if you are a guest this morning, I hope I'll have the time to meet you. I'll be out this way, out in this foyer after the service, and I hope you'll come by and I'd like to give you a free book and uh, to just uh, get to know you. So please stop by, at least say hi. Uh, I would really appreciate that. Would you take your Bibles, please, this morning and go to the Gospel according to John? And we'll find ourselves in John chapter 17 this morning. We're going to look a little bit at the chapters prior to that, but we're going to focus on John chapter 17. If you need a Bible, you can probably find one there in front of you. Oh, nope, we don't have them in the pew. That's right. Uh, We've moved all that out for right now. There are some located in the foyer, so if you need to get up and grab one of those, that's okay. Or maybe someone near you is kind enough to share along, and uh, we want to make sure that you can see the printed Word of God this morning in John chapter 17. Well, we are in a missions theme, let the nations be glad. What a day that will be when people from every tribe and kindred and nation join together to sing praise and to worship our Lord. What a day that will be. Let the nations be glad. And we are a part of that mission, church. We have a responsibility to share the gospel with the world, with every person that we can. Last Sunday night, Pastor Doug gave such a helpful message in speaking of the priority of the Bible in our own personal lives. When, it, when, when we see that, that role in the area of missions, I encourage you to listen to it if you can. Uh, I want to sort of continue on that theme a little bit in focusing on the priority of the Word of God in the mission of the church. The priority of the Word of God in the mission of the church. And I believe we will see that in John chapter 17, verses 14 through 20. I'd like to read these verses, and then I'd like to sort of give a lengthy introduction because I want to make sure that we get the context for what's taking place in this passage in John 17. And I, and I, and I believe that once we get the context, it's really going to help us in really grasping the 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 weight of the words that we have before us. So let's look here at John 17, beginning in verse 14. These are the words of Jesus. I have given them thy word, and the world hath hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, speaking of believers, speaking specifically of the disciples as Jesus was with them at this point. Remember last week I mentioned that God has left us here on purpose. We're not here on accident. He has you on this planet at this time for a specific purpose. And just to sort of break out of our American normal, it's not so that you and I can uh, have the perfect little life and have all of our comforts met and everything just goes smoothly. He has us for something so much bigger than that, so much grander than that, so much more awesome and glorious than that, and that is his master redemptive plan. And he has you, and he has me, and he has us here for such a time as this. And I pray that you will see your role in that more and more every single day. So he says, I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world. And some of us would say, ooh, but I wish you would take us out of this world, right? You ever think that? Lord, today would be a good day. You ever thought that? Lord, I think right now would be a good time, but he hasn't chosen to do that yet. So he has us here on purpose. But that thou shouldest keep them, notice this, keep them from the evil. And I mentioned last week that you could add the word one right there in your Bible, right after the word evil, because that's really what is implied here, that God would keep his children from the, uh, not simply the attack, but that 
but that Satan would be able to steal God's children. You know, I'm thankful this morning that uh, God's keeping me, I'm not keeping him. Aren't you thankful for that? <laughs> and that when he holds on to us, we're secure. And here's Jesus praying, God the Son, praying to God the Father, saying, I pray that you'll keep them. And we know that whatever Jesus prays is accomplished, and God keeps us. Verse 16, they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them. The word means uh, to set apart for holiness. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. You see the the necessity of the Word of God. It is by the work of the Holy Spirit as He uses the Word of God, He changes us. Just like you and I would look at a mirror and we would see our reflection and we would come away saying, this needs to change and this needs to change and I need to apply a little bit of stuff here and, and I need to move this over there. Or I, I, I have to change some things. The Word of God changes us. It, it, it transforms us by the power of God. Verse 18, as thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I have sanctified myself. Jesus speaking of the fact that he has, he has given himself for a specific mission that he is on task to do. Specifically, giving his life on the cross of Calvary for our sins. And in fact, in just hours, Jesus would be betrayed and he would go to the cross for our sins. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself that they also might be sanctified through the truth. Neither pray I for these alone. In other words, I'm not simply praying for my disciples, notice this, but for them also which shall believe on me, future tense, through their word. Boy, that's such a helpful passage. And I want to spend the time we have remaining in this passage this morning, the priority of the word of God in the mission of the church. The word of God is foundational to our mission. It has been said that prayer expresses the soul's longing for God. Like dry ground that longs for a fall rain to quench its parched surface, so Psalm 143, verse 6 says this, I stretch forth my hands unto thee, my soul thirsteth after thee as a thirsty or a parched land. We understand that a little bit right now, don't we? As we've gone a great amount of time without rain and just recently have, have, have had just a little bit of rainfall, the ground begins to crack and we begin to see things begin to wither. He's saying that prayer is crying out, seeing our desperate need for the Lord. God's people are to be praying people. And the Bible is filled with the prayers of God's people. In the Old Testament, we see that over and over again. The followers of God, such as Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, Naomi, Job, David, Isaiah, Gideon, they all were people who prayed. They cried out to God. In the New Testament, the disciples, they prayed. The leaders in the early church, they were people of prayer. There are examples of prayer all throughout the Bible. What you and I have before us this morning in John 17 I believe is the greatest of all of those examples. In the Old Testament and in the New Testament, what we have right here is unique and it is special. John 17 provides for us the words of Jesus while he was on earth. And we read often that Jesus prayed, but it is rare that we actually have the words to his prayers. And right here in John 17, we get a front row seat to one of Jesus' prayers, and we get to read it all. It's, in fact, beginning in John 17 and verse 1, and, and running through the length of the chapter, we have a prayer given by God the Son to God the Father. I mentioned last week that John chapter 13 through John 17 provides some of the most comforting words of Jesus' earthly ministry. It makes sense that these words would be so helpful, so caring, so tender. 
that Jesus' disciples were anxious. They were worried. They were overwhelmed with fear. Jesus was telling them that he would leave soon. The cross was only literally hours away. And Jesus' disciples longed for him to conquer Rome and lead them into comfort and a place of prominence. But Jesus told them that he would be leaving soon, and they were not going with him. The one they had spent such personal time with over the past three years would now be leaving. And they were confused, and they were worried and concerned. A good word would be anxious. In chapter 13 and verse 1, I mentioned it last week, but there in that verse, Jesus began assuring them that he would complete the work that he began in them. You recall the last part of that. It says, having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. That word end, it means unto conclusion, unto completion meaning that he was going to do his total work. When Jesus saves you, he doesn't drop you. He doesn't forget what he's doing. He doesn't walk into one room and forget why he ever walked into the room in the first place. He knows exactly what he's doing. He's intentional about what he's done. And if you are a child of God this morning, my friend, Jesus will complete his work to the very end. And I don't know what that does in your heart, but in me, it just screams, amen, glory to God. Because it's not about me. I can't do this. And I often fail, but I am held by the awesome, powerful hand of God. He then, in chapter 13, he then gave them a beautiful picture. He washed their feet. He taught them a lesson in servanthood. You know, as I thought about that, that this week, I, I was sort of overwhelmed by this truth. I, I, I really believe that I would not have a problem washing s- some of your feet. That was, a, that was a word carefully chosen, right? But you know, really, I mean that because we're family. And if that is what, what, was, if, if that is what was needed, then I'm fine with that. You and I are all prone to serve those who serve us. I love you. I think that many of you would say the same thing. You'd say, if it came down to it, take them off, buddy. I will do that. I will serve you. I will, I will do what needs to be done because I love you. And so we're all prone to be willing to extend mercy and grace and love to those who have done the same to us. But I want you to catch this this morning, that Jesus did not only wash the feet of those who loved him. I mean, who was a part of this group? Were all of them men who loved Jesus? These were his people who traveled with him on earth, but you know who's in the crowd, right? I mean, these were his disciples, but... They're, they're at the Lord's Supper. This is time that there's something going to happen towards the end of the supper, but he's still there. You know who he is? It's Judas, right? And Jesus is willing to wash his feet. Jesus served the one who would be the betrayer, the liar, the deceiver, the backstabber. You know, as we consider missions... Can I ask you this morning, are you growing in servanthood? Do you seek to move towards those who have offended you in mercy and grace? Or do you build walls? At the last meal, Jesus gave us a powerful lesson in humility. He taught us what it looks like to love others to serve others. Judas then betrayed Jesus. He left. He went out to betray Jesus. And the disciples were left confused. And in John 14, we've gone from 13 now to John 14, we have some of the the most comforting words in all of Scripture. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God? Believe also in me. 
In my Father's house are many mansions or rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And whither I go, you know, and the way you know. And Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? And Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto me, cometh unto the Father but by me. And there at the end of, or in the middle of John 14, we have some more just comforting words as he talks about he's going to leave, but he's actually going to stay. He actually says, I'm going to leave the Holy Spirit with you. Notice verse 18, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. Jesus continued sharing with them the vital relationship they had together with him. In John chapter 15, they were the vines. He was the branch. Or, and in John 15, 4, abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine, no more can ye except ye abide in me. And not only did Jesus tell them of, of his impending death, but I want you to catch this in John 16 and verse 1 that he also told them not only of his coming death, but of their coming death. In John 16, verse 1, These things have I spoken to you, that ye should not be offended. Hey, I want you to expect this. This is going to come. I want you to know that difficult days are on the horizon. They shall put you out of the synagogues. The time cometh that whosoever killeth you will think that they doeth God's service. They actually will think that they're doing the right thing. They actually will do it in the name of religion, in the, in the, in the name of worship. And the world will hate you, and the world will kill you. Why? Because the world hates Jesus. And in this moment, Jesus looks to God the Father, called Jesus is often called Jesus's high priestly prayer. Notice here in John 17, well, let's just let's just catch the 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 last phrase of John 16 in verse 33. In the world you will have, you see the word, tribulation. Mark it down. The health and wealth prosperity doesn't hold up. You're going to face difficulty. You're going to face trial. You're going to face heartache. You're going to lose what you have. But be of good cheer. What in the world could give me cheer in the midst of hearing that I'm going to lose everything? What could actually be a comfort in the midst of knowing that, that, that I may lose my life, that, that, that the world is going to hate me? Here it is. Jesus says, here's the good news I have overcome the world. I am victorious, and because I am victorious, Jesus says, so also are my children. Do you know that this morning, that we're victors? You may say this morning, I don't feel like it. I don't care about your feelings, right? I, now, when I say that, I mean, I don't care to, like, I don't want to offend you, but what I'm saying is, it's not built on our feelings. This morning, when my alarm went off, I didn't feel very good. As I went driving down 46 this morning with a trailer behind me and I had strapped some oh, big truck inner tubes that I had for some youth games that I did this week and I didn't strap them down good enough. So at 6.30 in the morning, it's pitch black. Inner tubes are blown off the back of my trailer. And I get to the church and I'm already kind of running behind. I like to get here and be here alone and quiet and just spending some time here alone. But I'm driving up and down 46 in the dark looking for black inner tubes in the dark. I can't find them. They're still out there. If you see them, bring them back, will you? They're somewhere between here and Steinsville. You know, I came in, I sat down. It's like, I'm supposed to preach on be of good cheer. I don't feel like it. I don't feel like very happy. Can I tell you that Jesus is talking about something so much deeper? He's talking about in you. He's talking about his deep work in you. 
He's talking about the reality of Christ living within you. He's talking about the fact that Jesus gave his blood so that you, as you respond in faith to the gospel, could be his child. And my friend, that truth, who cares about inner tubes, right? I mean, I do, but I don't, right? We understand that because, because what Jesus is saying transforms the way that you and I see life. And in this moment, Jesus looks to God the Father. Notice chapter 17, verse 1. And here, as they're hearing this news of coming persecution and tribulation and difficulty, Jesus is giving throughout this some of the most precious, comforting words in all of Scripture. Don't be anxious. I know I'm telling you some things that are overwhelming, but I want you to know some truths. And in chapter 17, he, gets, he gives us a front row seat to this beautiful prayer of Jesus's. These words spake Jesus, the Son of God, speaking to the Son, speaking to God the Father, and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify thy Son, that thy Son also may glorify thee. It's really a declaration of the purpose of his life, that he would go, that, that, that he would point people to the Father. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father, right? As you look at me, if you want to see God, look at God in God the Son. He's glorifying, and, and, and he's about to go to the cross so that you and I will one day be glorified. Scriptures say he lifted up his eyes. You know, it's always good to look up. To have a heart that looks toward the only one who can give life. The one from which all mercy flows. This prayer by God the Son to God the Father shows us both Jesus' submission to the Father's will and his equality as God the Son. And if we were to break down this prayer just sort of as an outline, if you would like this, and this isn't original with me, you can find this in many places, but, but verses 1 through 5, Jesus prays for himself. He's, he's going to go to the cross. And so he begins by, by, by praying for himself and, 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 and that he would accomplish what needs to be accomplished. In verses 6 through 19, and we're going to look at some of this, Jesus prays for his disciples. And then beginning in verse number 20 and down, he prays for his church. Now, in my time remaining, here's what I want to do. I want to blur through this portion we have, and then I'm going to come back next week and talk more about it. It's a wonderful picture for us. Christ told his disciples that he was leaving them, and he was leaving them on earth for a specific mission. Verse number 15. That mission was to make the message of Jesus known in their community, in their region, and the known world. It was about their involvement in sharing Christ so that the nations would be glad. And yet this news was so heavy for them. And how were they to go forward? How could they put by faith one foot forward when they were hearing such difficult news? And at that moment, here is just a, just a wonderful truth. At that moment, the Son of God spoke. He actually prayed, and he prayed for them, which that in and of itself is an amazing truth. In a time when anxiety was at its highest, Jesus Christ prayed for his disciples. This is really a real-time lesson for us in Philippians 4. Be careful, full of care. Be, be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God and the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. What does Jesus pray for those who were left to spread his message? 
What is the prayer that his disciples get to hear? What did he pray for those who would face death because of their faith in Jesus? What, what is in his prayer? Well, I want to focus for a few moments on these verses. First of all, I want you to notice this. He's, he's in, 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 and in all of these three, he's drawing their attention to the priority of the truth. Because it's not feelings that get us through. It's the truth that gets us through. It's anchoring ourselves, not on my word. I'd be thrilled, I, and this is the truth, I would be thrilled if you would say, and, and, and I ask the Lord to, to, to humble me, um, to help me in this, but I'd be thrilled if none of you ever said, you know, Pastor Steve over there really is doing, I mean, it's just a great message, just a great help. I would be far more thrilled if it was, I just want to tell you, God's word is doing a work in my life. Because it's not my word, it's his word. Whoever's sharing it, may this church always be anchored in that our focus and our priority is not thus saith my pastor or thus saith my teacher, but thus saith the Lord, his truth. So first of all, I want you to notice this, that he prayed that the truth of God would define them, that the truth of God would define them. And we can find this really all throughout this passage, but just look specifically at verse 14. I have given them thy word. What is it that would separate these early believers from the unbelievers? It was the truth. They were people who had the truth of God. They were people who responded to the truth. They were people who were called to proclaim the truth about Jesus. And church, our most precious possession in all of the world is the revealed word of God. For without it, out it, you and I have no chance to ever know God. So what are we? We are, Timothy said, we are the pillar and ground of the truth. We are the proclaimers of the truth. We are a lighthouse. We are a beacon. We are a bright light shining through the darkness. Not about us, but they speak the truth. They tell the truth. They don't hide behind the truth. They don't, wor they don't water down the truth. And we're in a day and age where, I mean, there's a great lack of the truth. You and I have the truth. We talked last week about the priority of loving our community, and, 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 and that, is such a, that is such an important thing for you and me to hear. John 13, 35, By this shall all men know that you are my disciples. Here it is, if you love if you have love one for another. Wow. Let's just take some self-inventory for a moment. Are you known for your love for others? Are you known for your Christ-like love for others in this room? Or are you known for something else? Now, here's what I walked away from last week as I contemplated and thought about the message even more. There is a great danger to simply talking about love. I think you know that. There's a pit that we have to be careful of. Uh, love is a vehicle, but truth is the message. And they both work together in tandem. They both are essential and they must be seen together in Scripture. In fact, I think the interesting thing is, if you'd go back and read thir chapter 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, you'd find that the words love and truth are intertwined all throughout those passages. It's a really neat thing to see. And our culture force-feeds us lies about truth and love. Truth is scrutinized, and love has simply become a synonym for acceptance tolerance. Biblically, the truth should never be sacrificed at the expense of love. The two need each other. In, fa in fact, without the truth, you cannot properly love. Love and truth cannot be void of each other. I'm looking forward to this next Saturday, and I hope all of y'all, all of I hope you're all here. 
And I hope we give out flyers and invites, and I hope it's just a wonderful, safe event that we can have here at church, and we just love on our community. And people say, why did you just do this? Because we love you. But love is not acceptance. Love must give the truth. And that's, that's our message, is the truth about who God is and truth about who we are and truth about who Jesus is and truth about how we should respond. And so the truth actually demands that we say hard things. You see, love without the truth will eventually reveal itself as self-love. And truth without love, just truth without love becomes, it is just self-righteousness. And as we answer the call to love our community, we must understand the priority of the truth. As the church, we're called to share the truth in love. Love is the vehicle by which truth is conveyed, but the truth is what we must convey. The truth about man lost in their sins and on their way to a godless hell without Jesus Christ. But the great news is that God in his love hath sent his son to die for our sins. And you and I, by God's grace, can be reconciled to God. So the word of God is foundational to our mission. As Jesus prays for his disciples, he reminds them of the foundation for worldwide missions. Their, mis- their message is to be truth, and that is what is to define the church. We are a church that may have a lot of things and a lot of events and a lot of things taking place, but if those things become what we're known for, we've missed it. We are to be known for the truth. Number two, the word of God would not only define them, but it would divide them. Now, when I say divide, I'm not meaning divide the disciples. I'm meaning it would divide them from the world. Notice in verse 14 through 16, it's really what he's communicating. Verse 14, the latter part, they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Verse 15, I've left you in the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. You see, we have a job to do. The world would hate them because they would proclaim the truth. Because the world would communicate tolerance and the world would communicate acceptance. And yet those who know the truth would in love stand up and say, I can't. Because this is the truth. This is the word of God. And I understand what your feelings may tell you and what your emotions may tend to uh, the areas where it may want you to drift. But it is the word of God from which you and I get our instruction. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 19 and 20, I won't turn there now. I encourage you to look at it later. But he gives us this specific job as a job of reconciliation. And what is it that brings reconciliation? It's the truth, the word of God. And many will not accept this truth. And Jesus said that they should expect hatred because they reject the truth. Oh, I don't want that. I don't glory in separation. I'm not looking for weird ways to separate myself from the world. You know, well, they they do this. Therefore, let me, you know, try to dress weirder than they do so that that kind of separates us. And, you know, all these kind of things that we can kind of put on ourselves to try to separate us. You know what separates us? Jesus does. It's the truth. It's what he's doing in me. It's his word. It's, It's his word. I say, I just can't. We look for ways to interact with our culture so that we have gospel opportunities, but at the same time, we understand that division is to be expected. And this is hard, isn't it? Especially when it's family. I pray for some of you I know who have faced seasons of separation and you've been broken and you've prayed about it because because your position in love on the word of God has brought about division. Notice the end of verse 15. I think this is helpful. Jesus prayed that God the Father would keep them from the evil. I mentioned earlier, that's it. That, 
it's, it's implied here that God would keep them from Satan, from the evil one. Do you know there's nothing that Satan would love more than to steal your salvation? He wishes he could do that, but he can't. That's great, isn't it? Uh, in fact, earlier in this chapter, uh, Jesus says, all that you've given to me, you're not going to lose. I mean, you've given them to me, so that's sealed, done, settled, put in a safe until the day in which uh, the Holy Spirit is our seal and we will be before Christ uh, in, in all of glory. Satan would love to steal your salvation. He cannot. Because Jesus has overcome chapter 16, verse 33. And so what he does is he sets out to do the, the next best thing. And that is he sets out to discourage you. He sets out to discourage you. And I think this is a good place in this point that the word of God will divide and you will face times when, although he cannot steal your soul, if you are a child of God, he will do all that he can to discourage you, to say, you know, you know it's just not worth it. You know, this is just too hard. And I think that this is, this is a great place to just say this. The reality of verse 15 is one of the most powerful truths in overcoming discouragement. And you say, well, what is, what is that reality? It's this that Jesus is praying for you. Now, I don't know what that does for you, but that's the reality in verse 15, that in the midst of discouragement and trials where Satan is trying to pull you down and drag you down, let me, let me encourage you with this great truth, that just as Jesus prays for his disciples here, Jesus now in intercessory prayer does the same for you. In your seasons of discouragement by the powers of Satan, the Son of God is praying on your behalf in intercessory prayer. And my friend, I, I, I encourage you today, keep your eyes on Christ. Keep your eyes on Christ. So the Word of God, it thirdly, it defines, it divides and it delivers. The word of God delivers. Notice verse 17. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. I'm going to take time next week to develop this more. This word sanctify means to make holy. It means to set apart for God's specific work. You see, the word of God is truth, and the Bible tells us that the truth shall set you free. It shines a light on the deceitful lies of Satan. It shines a light on our own deceitful hearts that we don't even know. It shows us the error of our own way. It shows us the way of life. It proclaims truth. We are changed by the work of the Word in our own lives. Let me ask you this morning, are you growing in your Christ-likeness? If not, the byproduct of that is that your message is probably not the gospel. Instead, it's a message that may undermine the mission of the church. Would you submit today to the work of the Word of God? It is true that only sanctified believers are truly eager to tell the nations about Jesus. In fact, I want you to notice one more thing. I did not put it in your notes, but if you look down at verse 20, the latter part, Jesus goes on to say, disciples, I'm praying for the disciples, but now I'm praying for those who will come to Christ as a result of their work. You know, the Word of God also demands that you and I would share the truth of the gospel. Jesus prays for his church. He's praying for us as you and I desire to be a part of his massive plan to let the nations be glad. So what is the response of our hearts to this prayer? Well, there's a few things. First of all, God, I pray that the divisiveness that's in my heart, and I pray that the divisiveness that, that I may experience in this world 
is solely a, is solely a result of your work in me and not my own pride. Let me say that again. God, I pray that the divisiveness that I may experience in this world, maybe with people in my own family and people in our community, I pray that it's not a result of my own pride, but that it would only be the result of God's good work in us as we are changed by his word. Number two, God, I... I repent of my own neglect of your word and ask for a daily desire to read and obey your word more. Is the word of God a priority in your life? There's a lot of things that steal our attention. Do you value the word of God? If we as a church are going to uphold the truth, obviously it has to take place from this pulpit. It has to take place in our classes, but it also has to take place in lives that respond to the truth in a positive way and say, yes, I want the Word of God. I crave the Word of God. As some of you right now are thinking, and I probably shouldn't say this, but because now I'll get you thinking this the whole time, is I wish I just had lunch. And a, just a big old Pop-Tart, you know? What? No, no. Man, a, a hamburger or meatloaf or a pot roast or spaghetti or whatever it is. Oh, I just crave it. Man, I need something. My stomach's starting to growl. The more you're talking about it, I can just feel it coming on. I mean, you, shouldn't have, you, you better not do this at the beginning of the message. I hope you're about done because right now I'm just thinking about food. I want something to eat. I need something to eat. If I don't get something to eat, I'll start to get weak, and then I, then I won't have the strength to go forward. I need some food. My friend, Helen, do you feel that way? Okay. She identifies. And you know, I feel the same way often. I pray that my craving for God's word would would far exceed that. God, I need your word. I confess that my prayers are often for my own gain. So today... I pray for those who are in need of the truth more than I am in need of my own possessions, my own comfort, my own glory. Let's pray together. Father, I'm so grateful to know that you pray for us. In my bitterness and anger, hard-heartedness change me sanctify me through thy truth pray as I lead my children my family, my wife my own feelings, my own opinions would not be what govern me but your word Lord make me a servant help me to be humble Help me to love those who've wronged me. Those maybe even right now who could come to my mind or someone else's mind as we think about, Lord, uh, ways in which we've been wronged and ways we've not agreed. I pray that you would take the truths of Scripture, change us. May we respond in confession of our sin. May we realize that we don't even know our own hearts and so we don't It is a bad road to go down to think we make our own decisions and that we think we're okay, but to use your word and to, Lord, lay us open. Search me, O God. Your word is able to slice through. It is a a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Sanctify me. Lord, I pray that would be our prayer in here today. Sanctify us. God, as we consider an opportunity to have an opportunity to love on our community, I pray that, Lord, in those opportunities, when we're tempted to just think it's all about love, I pray we would understand, no, no, it's about the truth. 
And as we give forth the truth, we ought do that from love because you've done something in us that doesn't make sense. You've loved us and we're unlove, unlovely. And some of us at times, we, we look at someone else and we almost can't stand them. And God, that just shows how wicked and undone we are. That we think that someone else doesn't deserve mercy and grace and love. And at the same time, we think that we deserve yours. May we repent of that. Break us, Lord. Our community is in great need of the truth. Our church is in need of the truth. God, I pray that as we consider this prayer, that we would rejoice in the truth that you, you prayed for your own disciples. And then you prayed for those who would come to faith in you as a result of their message. And Lord, in, in many ways, I could say that that's me. And you do pray for me. I'm thankful that whatever you pray is accomplished. Pray if there's someone here today that's never responded in faith to the gospel of Jesus. I pray today they would turn to you in faith. In Jesus' name.